let's see. So, uh, brothers, Kenneth, why don't you open us up in prayer here? And then, uh, or if you're, let me know if your sound's not working for some reason. But uh, otherwise, if you'll open us up in prayer. And um, no particular announcements here. Uh, I will get the, the Moodle page. I haven't, I haven't put time into getting things organized there. Uh, but I'll get some time into that. Maybe during the break, I can get a couple of things dropped in there. Um, but so far, we haven't had any needs. Uh, coming up next time on Monday, we'll be back to our normal time, so 8 to 10. And that's with Andrew Nicelli. Um, if we have a homework assignment, I'll get that up there on the Moodle page. But uh, pro what we've done so far is just giving assignments after the lecture, which works great too. So that's it. That's uh, all I have as far as I know. So, so Brother Kenneth, uh, if you don't mind leaving us in prayer, and then we'll go. Okay, let's uh, have a word of prayer. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we give you thanks for this time that we can uh, study and, and hear your word. Uh, we pray, Father, that you will help us even as we learn how to look into uh, intertextuality, how the testaments and uh, scriptures relate to one another. We pray that you will guide our teacher, uh, uh, Dr. Samuel, and uh, be with us and guide us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Okay, so um, I did a, a my dissertation on a couple of things, really. Um, it was focused on the book of Jonah, but specifically when, when I started my dissertation study, the whole idea of a literary theological analysis had already, by Bob Jones anyway, pretty fully been developed. And as I got into the literature, I discovered that there seemed to be another level of research that was necessary of um, interpretation. In other words, we emphasize the idea of interpreting a verse within the chapter, within its context, not taking it out of context. And you can go broader in the idea of context. Uh, putting a chapter within the book and and then you can go broader in the context idea and this is where my study comes in uh, instead of stopping with the, the concept of I shouldn't read a verse in isolation of its chapter or a chapter in isolation of its section or book um, we also shouldn't read a book an entire book in isolation of the whole storyline of scripture. Um, after I, I completed my dissertation in the last several years, there has been more of an emphasis on reading the Bible as one unified story. So if you're familiar with the Bible Project videos, they have put out a lot of very helpful overviews of, of the storyline of scripture. So in a sense, I think that's the modern um, what ended up being the, the final version of what I was doing with canonical analysis, I think is just placing a book in light of the storyline of scripture, but maybe what I did is a little more specific, more connected textually, instead of this, just the generic story. There are specific phrases, there are specific chapters, or even ideas that a certain book communicates that are directly connected with previous revelation and kind of pick up on the story. So if we can think of the, the canonical analysis, I, I put here a definition for you. I define it as uh, the discipline. Let me move that there. Okay, the discipline that interprets the biblical text in light of the totality of the canon of scripture. Um, so, as we think about that very basic, and you have to understand where I'm coming from, when I was doing my dissertation, um, even to this day, there's no consensus on what a canonical analysis is, and what I found is there were two main 
authors who were referencing this, this whole idea. One of them was Brevard Childs, who is a liberal scholar who accepts the presuppositions of, of critical interpretation, that is, the Bible, even though he emphasized the canon, it's made up of, it was put together by different authors that are not explicitly detailed in the text. So he's looking outside of the text for clues inside the text to try to piece together, okay, this one guy that we don't know wrote this part and this other guy that we don't know wrote this other part and coming up with names for them. That's where he was coming from. And uh, I, I think he found it a little bit frustrating that you can never really get to a discussion of the final form of the, of the book and the canon because we're always talking about these background issues. So he came up with this idea of a canonical analysis. Let's get beyond all the critical uh, sources and all of that and just deal with the text as we have it in the Bible. Um, he still kept all his presuppositions, but that's, that's what it boiled down to. Uh, Salheimer was the conservative version of that, and he was trying to put together a bigger picture of, for example, with the Pentateuch. Um, he saw this as one complete book. So instead of interpreting the Pentateuch as five different books, it's ultimately one book that's put together by one author. Um, the difficulty that I found with his methodology is that he was trying to read between the lines to piece together um, what the author of the Pentateuch was trying to do. And there was no way of verifying in the text itself whether or not his conclusions about the Pentateuch were actually what the author intended. So it, it seemed a bit subjective. Um, so I came across several articles that did, that practiced what I viewed was the ultimate goal of, of interpretation, and that is um, interpreting the book within its section. So if I'm, if I'm working with the Pentateuch, I would put Exodus as part of, a, of the Torah, of the five books, and that would be the immediate context of Exodus or Leviticus or Numbers. And when you read the, the, the Hebrew text, uh, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, they all begin with an and connecting the book to the previous one as one ongoing story. And, and that's not just a, a generic narrative and, but a deliberate conjunctive joining Exodus to Leviticus. A lot of times it picks up right where the previous book left off. So we see that unity of the books in the first five books of the Bible. And what the canonical approach that I'm, that I'm proposing is doing is essentially the same thing, but with the rest of scripture that um, God is telling one story and he's telling it in a particular order and the order matters. And when he continues a story, he's presupposing that you've had exposure and are aware of the previous parts of the story. Um, it would be a little strange for me um, to read a book and just kind of randomly say, okay, here's a book. What should I read today? Uh, eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Let me flip through the pages randomly. Uh, well, let me start right here in a book. I have no idea what has come before. And I don't know what comes after, but page 151 seems like a great place to start. Well, that would be strange. Um, it's the same thing as if I'm watching a movie. I don't kind of just skip to one of the scenes. Then let's say there are 50 scenes. Uh, scene 35, let's start there. Okay, stop. Let's go back to scene five. Okay, stop. Let's go forward to scene 40. Okay, stop. And just jumping around. That's not the way we watch a movie. That's not the way we read a book. We don't read a book by going to page 151 and reading, let's see which line jumps out at me and 
You know, that'll be the, the message that the author intended for me. Line 10 from page 151. And yet that's exactly what we do with the Bible. We treat it as if it were not literature, as if it's not a story that's being told, that's unfolding in a sequential order. And so what the canonical approach is trying to do is saying, wait a minute, as we approach the Bible, so here's some of the tenets. It has one author. So recognizing that there are human authors, God used holy men, and he breathed out his word through them. But ultimately, he's the one who gave the story. He's the one who knows what he's already said, knows what he's about to say, and he's communicating to, it, to us as human beings the way we normally communicate, and that is by telling stories. Some of these reader Bibles, I think, are shooting at, at doing that, of making us not focus so much on chapter and verse divisions that are artificial, but looking more at the, the story, episodes, that kind of a format. So what the canonical approach is doing is recognizing the Holy Spirit. He's writing this whole work of literature. And when we read it, we need to be mindful of what the author has already revealed. Read it in its context in the whole canon of Scripture. So when we do that, um, it gives us a full, final interpretation of the text. Not, so let's just say I want to study the book of Jonah, which we'll look at Jonah today. It doesn't mean that I can't understand the book of Jonah pretty well uh, without connecting it to the rest of Scripture. However, there are some things that Jonah reveals that require pre-knowledge of who, what a prophet is, who God is, uh, who the Ninevites are, why Jonah would run away, uh, even the ge the setting, the geography, the all of that is presupposed that you have some idea of what the author is talking about. Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense. So the, the canonical interpretation is saying, uh, as we interpret the Bible, we need to make sure that we see the text, not only, okay, I've done my homework with Jonah, but the Pentateuch feeds in these ideas into the book of Jonah. Jonah maybe builds on some of those themes from the Pentateuch and previous revelation, and is going to add some unique ideas that no other book adds. And then other books, not all books carry all ideas, but other books, maybe another prophet or the New Testament authors, or somewhere in the rest of the canon, it's going to continue a theme that Jonah either introduced or continued developing. And that's, that's what I mean by the fullest final interpretation. So when I re as a New Testament believer, when I go back to read the Old Testament, I don't read it just as if um, the original audience understanding is all there is. But I read it with, here's the full canon of the Bible. Here's how God ended up using that book in the rest of Scripture. And now I understand better how that portion of Scripture um, fits into the storyline of Scripture and what God was trying to do uh, with that. In other words, it's the kind of thing that we do in literary analysis of a work of literature where we go back and interpret a chapter or a section and we discuss what was the author intending by placing this chapter here or this story here or or whatever it just gives us a, a better appreciation of the artistry of the author uh, maybe sometimes some of the fine details that the author had in mind and that's what we're trying to do with the canonical interpretation uh, so that's tenet number two. Tenet number three rejects a canon within a canon. What I mean by canon within a canon is that we might be prone to treat certain parts of Scripture as more important 
than others or more authoritative. Even if we don't do it in principle, we'll do it in practice. Um, and when you use the, this approach, you recognize that all of scripture is profitable and meant to be studied and, and placed in its context. Um, number four, it rests on a historical grammatical exegesis. So I'm gonna illustrate uh, what that means, how I would suggest studying any book really. Uh, you, you still go through the process of careful exegesis and you work through that, yeah, but you continue. You don't stop with, okay, here's what this word means and here's what this verse means, but you keep putting it within its bigger, broader context. Uh, number five, affirms the historical reality of the text. Some of the points I put in here are because of some of the liberal usage um, of canonical analysis and what is meant by that. So obviously as believers, we're affirming, conservative scholars, we're affirming that when we read the text, that that is real history. Um, this is not just a parable or a myth. And especially with the book of Jonah, uh, it's pretty, authors are pretty bold in declaring this is just a fairy tale, there's no way this happened, this is grandiose, it's ludicrous, it's absurdity to take it in any way as something that actually happened. So the steps that we're going to follow here are to determine the historical setting and composition, and we'll interpret the text using literary and theological analysis and take the message of the book and then study it in light of the rest of scripture. So um, I'm going to take you through highlights of what I did with the book of Jonah, illustrate what, what the procedure is, and kind of take, so we'll start with the literary analysis, then go into theological analysis, and then illustrate a couple of points of canonical analysis, specifically with the book of, of Jonah. Related topics that with, when, what's that? Can I jump in with two questions here? Yeah. Um, so one, it's actually a question I was asking myself, but, and uh, just to comment on this, a question I'm still struggling through is how much we do our exegesis of the Old Testament text kind of as an isolate before we add the New Testament development. And I'm thinking here of commentators, uh, Golden Gaze, Psalms, which is great but where he wants to do the full exegesis in the Old Testament context, cut off from the New Testament development. Um, and trying to think through, yeah, so is there some kind of ultimacy? Is there some kind of an order, a primacy we give to its original context before we do the New Testament theologizing? Thoughts there? Yeah, I would say definitely we want to start with the original Old Testament context. And so that's, that's step one. Here, determining historical setting and composition uh, and interpret using the literary and theological analysis. So I think it's appropriate to try to get at what did the original audience understand by what the author is saying? What, what did it mean to them? But I, I think what you're getting at is that Golden Gate stops there and says, okay, this is all it means or maybe overly emphasizes that. So I've seen authors do that with Psalm 22. Let's take Psalm 22 and um, what they say is, well, regardless of how it's been interpreted historically, this Psalm itself has nothing to do with the cross. It's just a, a lament Psalm. The Psalmist was having personal struggles and Jesus borrows the language and it was never predictive at all. Uh, I think that's overemphasizing the historical context to the neglect of the canonical connections. So I think it's helpful. I mean, Psalm 22 did have a history, and it probably was used hyperbolically by believers who felt that the Lord was silent, but nobody really literally went through um, the majority of what that Psalm says. <laughs> to that level. And so I would take that Psalm as messianic. And, and the reason I do that is because of how the New Testament ends up using that Psalm. 
um, and finding its ultimate meaning, in a sense, in Christ. And I think we could do that with a lot of the songs. So I do think we need to start with, we can't just jump to the New Testament final lens and then kind of, because if we do that, we will skew what's actually there. So um, in other words, I don't want to jump too quickly to what I know to be true as a Christian <laughs> or maybe to what I've always heard. I want to let the text guide me and and the wording be derived from the text directly and then say all right i understand what it's saying here let me see if i can find other places in scripture that will give insight into what god intended because all scripture is profitable for believers so what's that level of profit profitability for me does that make sense Oh yeah, that's that's very helpful. It's good. Were there um, any other questions on this first section? Joel? Yeah, secondary question was an, another guy, and I just, I'll just read what he wrote. Uh, if we reject the canon within a canon, how do we account for progressive revelation, i.e., the Pentateuch setting, like uh, having a role setting precedent for the other Old Testament authors, Jesus having a precedent setting role for the rest of the New Testament? So, you know, are there these portions of Scripture that, in a way, maybe like they are more significant in a way because they're setting precedent. Um, the, the idea of a canon within a canon is in a sense that um, as I'm reading a portion of scripture that it, it, it's going to basically become the Bible within the Bible. So because that says it, then if I find something else over here that says something that's slightly different, then I'm going to say, no, that's the Bible. And even though this is the Bible, it's not the Bible. <laughs> um, the canon within the canon, then it's, it's diminishing um, certain portions of scripture as somehow less informative or less authoritative even. Um, so we, I, I, as, as believers, so are there certain portions of script, scripture that I might find more helpful personally or that might be clear to address certain issues? Sure, but that doesn't mean that I should neglect other portions of scripture that in my current historical context, I don't find helpful. What the canonical approach is doing is saying there's a reason that the author put that in there. It might just be background information or, um, you know, not every part of a movie or part of a book is important, but if you're, if you're a good author, you want every part of your story to be meaningful and in some way contribute, even if that's just background, in some way it's gonna contribute to what you're trying to communicate. Otherwise, get rid of it. That's, you know, your editor's gonna say, uh, this is not helpful. It's not relevant. Let's let's get rid of that. So the the canonical interpretation is saying every word matters, every chapter matters. There's a reason for every verse and word in the Bible. And when I interpret Scripture this way, I can't say, well, that doesn't count as much. Um, it it is all profitable. Um, as far as personal application, I might struggle some, for example, with the allotment of the land in, in Joshua. As I read that as a modern reader, I might think, man, this is not, you know, this is not being very helpful. So what the canonical approach would do is say, okay, hold on, kind of take a bigger step, take a, take a step back and say, why is there so much material devoted to the allotment of the land and when you when you look at the pentateuch especially beginning in exodus god promised to give them land well even in, the, in genesis god promised abraham i'm going to give you land but not yet um we have this building of this desire this move toward the land god has promised us land and here we go if you're aware of that, and so you spend basically almost the entirety of the Pentateuch 
we're going to the promised land. We can't wait to get there. It's going to be awesome. And then they wander around for about 40 years. So when you go to the book of Joshua, if you understand how long it's been, one, one thing would be, this is a very big deal to them because they've been waiting for this all of their lives. <laughs> and it's finally here. And you view it more as a, we view it as boring details, but they would have viewed it as God's faithfulness to his word. Um, it might not have meaning for the modern reader, but by putting it within the canon of scripture, I can see, ah, but what I should go away from when I'm reading Joshua and the allotment of the land is, if God was faithful in the small details of the promises that he gave to his people, then he's going to be faithful in the promises that he makes to me. Um, and that's just an illustration of that for me. So besides that, I mean, could you imagine if somebody told you, uh, Joel, I'm going to give you $250,000. Uh, would that be something that you would be uh, eager to share with other believers? <laughs> God just gave me $250,000 or a house. That's what I'm getting at. Everybody got a house. They got property. They got gardens that they didn't plant. Um, and so understanding Yes, that might not be as exciting to read that, but there's still a reason and there's still value to that portion of scripture. Um, I might not use that to, to give any particular theological emphasis, uh, aside from showing who God is. And in the storytelling process, sometimes, you know, why, why am I including some details? Sometimes it's illustrating the artistry of the author, there are many reasons that could be there for including things. So I, the idea of a canon within a canon is just saying, we can just cut out chapter two, it doesn't matter, let's cut out this. And we're left with um, not as full a development of who God is, of his story, of his faithfulness. Um, so even though as a modern Christian, I might struggle, that, that's how I would answer that. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's helpful. And uh, Duncan, if you had further questions, follow up, drop that in there. If I'm getting the concept right of canon within a canon, the ultimate expression of canon within a canon would be Marcionism. Like you downgrade the entire Old Testament and exalt, or, you know, the Gospels. Jesus said this. Well, maybe Paul had a thing against women, but Jesus did that kind of. Is that right? Is that getting the concept right? Okay. Yeah. Like when we, when we do that, we're neglecting that the author has already spoken and he's building on things that he said and he's going to use the new revelation being given to develop something further and so I, I don't make scripture kind of contradict itself or um compete with itself it's there's one author ultimately and there are different nuances to what's being said so for example the gospels there there are several different perspectives going on there, but there's, it's helpful to, to put them together and say, okay, what's the full picture of what's being said instead of trying to get at, well, what Matthew says is more important than what Mark says because Matthew spent a lot more time saying it or what John said uh, is more important than, <laughs> it's, it's not a matter so much of importance or truth, it's just what they're emphasizing. And, and we need to hear everybody's voice and so the canonical analysis is in a sense trying to say, let everybody have their voice because ultimately there's one voice behind all these individual books. Were there any other questions on that before we move to some related? I think we're good. Okay. Uh, let's, let's, some things that sound similar or that are related in some way, I list here. Uh, first of all, the idea of the center of the canon. So as I'm trying to understand what the Holy Spirit is doing as he's writing the story, is there a center to the canon? Um, different ideas have been proposed on this, the idea of the kingdom, the idea of blessing or promise. Um, I think probably the most attractive one. <laughs> 
is the idea that Jesus is the center of the canon, that he is the one who um, puts all the story pieces together in the right place. So I don't, I don't really have a problem with, with that idea, but as I was doing my study, that was not what I focused on. And so I don't really get into that. Uh, number two, the full meaning, the census planor. Uh, I, if you understand what that phrase means and how it's used, the concept there is that I can't understand a verse in its own context at all. Um, and sometimes it doesn't even mean what I thought it meant without reading into that verse other scripture. So that's not what we're saying here. What we're saying is you can understand the verse fully within its context. And that's what it means. And I'm not going to change that meaning. I'm just going to put it in its context of, of how it's being used. All right. So I'll give you a funny example of that. Um, so there's, there's this commercial of a guy who's trying to make a romantic meal for his uh, wife. And so he's in the apartment cooking and he's gonna make spaghetti and, and meat sauce. Um, and so as he's putting in the, he's got the meat and he's putting in the, uh, the spaghetti sauce into the meat. And he was chopping up some vegetables um, their white cat jumps onto the stove and tips over the whole pan of sauce and covers the cat in red. And so the guy picks the cat up. So the cat is all red covered in the sauce and he's got the knife in the other hand. And just as he's doing that, his wife walks in. Right? So if you walk into that scene, what would you think? Gerard, if, if you were to walk in and uh, see your wife holding your cat, the cat is red and she's got a knife in the other hand, what do you think? <laughs> Anyone? <laughs> I just commented in here that the cat is finally getting what it deserves. <laughs> Right, so um, if I were to be using that as, as scripture, I would say, all right, I, I can understand a person holding a cat. Um, it looks bad, right? You, you don't have context. Um, so I'm not gonna say that there's more meaning to that idea uh, when I'm doing the canonical interpretation. What I'm saying is, He's not trying to kill the cat. <laughs> we know that because if we were there, the cat jumped up there and spilled the sauce on himself. And so he's trying to get the cat away so he doesn't start a fire or whatever. Um, so that's what the canonical analysis is versus the full sense would be to go in and say, um, you know, he hates cats and based on some other context, maybe the, the, the reason the wife would think this is that He's tried to throw the cat away or give it away before. And she would be reading into that some other experience that's not within the, the context of what was happening at that moment. And that's what the census planor means, that you can take a verse and say, okay, even though this is what it seems like the author is saying, he's not really saying that. Why? Because we have other scripture that changes the meaning of what the author was saying. So that is not what we are doing here. Number three, the analogy of scripture. So the best interpretation of scripture, the best commentary on scripture is what? Yeah, uh, <laughs> four different comments on here, scripture itself. Uh, feel free to chime in, everyone. Um, scripture is the best interpreter of Scripture. So when do we normally use the analogy of Scripture?
when we have a difficult text? Yeah. We, we find this obscure text and we say, I don't know what this means. So let me go to the rest of scripture and see if I can find anything that'll help me. All right. That's, that's good. But a canonical analysis is doing that with all passages, whether or not they're difficult. That's, that's the difference. It's a matter of emphasis that sometimes I think I know what something means, but by putting it in its broader context of scripture, I'm going to know that that's what it means. I'm going to, I'm going to have assurance, confirmation. That that's what is meant by that, whether or not I consider the passage difficult. All right. So we're just allowed, it's a broader um, idea. So analogy of scripture kind of fits under the umbrella of canonical interpretation. It's a subcategory of it, but I'm doing it with all scripture. I'm doing it with every passage that I'm reading, making sure that I understand what its purpose was. It's a matter of emphasis. And lastly, uh, canonical order. So this is a matter that's somewhat probably the, the most challenging part of the canonical uh, interpretation as I practice it is in what order should I study um, the scripture? In other words, we, we don't, with some of these books, we don't have a lot of evidence in the book telling us when, where, who, uh, regarding the authorship. So if I'm telling you a story, it matters what order I tell it in. Um, if I'm watching a movie, it matters what sequence I watch the scenes in, because that, that's going to change the way I interpret something. So, so let me give you an example. There's a Hebrew order of scripture, and then there's the Protestant order of scripture. If I'm reading the Hebrew order, I read Proverbs 31. Does anybody know in the Hebrew canon what follows Proverbs 31? What is Proverbs 31 about? This is a hint for you. The, the virtuous woman. Okay. She's the woman of Chayil. And in the Hebrew canon, that's followed immediately by the story of a woman of Chayil, who is... Think of a couple of guesses, maybe. <laughs> I'm gonna guess Song of Solomon or Esther. Mm -hmm. Okay. Ruth. It's a Ruth. It's the book of Ruth. Right. So, what I'm getting at there is, I'm reading about this virtuous woman, and then immediately followed by that, I read the story of Ruth. What does that do for your interpretation? You go, ah, that's what, a, that's what a virtuous woman looks like. Ruth serves to illustrate Proverbs 31, All right? So changing the order of something. So let's look at the Protestant order. Where is Ruth in the Protestant canon? Uh, comment in the chat after Judges. Okay, Joshua, Judges. I'm sorry, I'm not seeing the uh, chat function on here. That's why you're answering. No, no worries. Uh, just down at the bottom next to the share button or So there's a window in there somewhere. I'm not exactly sure how you're set up on your end. <laughs> All I'm seeing is my screen and then the, the camera feed of different people. I'm happy to just read comments as they come in. But Okay, yeah, that would that'd be helpful just so I can, if you guys are giving feedback and I'm not seeing it. Um, so if I'm reading the Protestant order, I read Joshua, the conquest. They get the land. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Yay. And then I get Judges, 
They don't drive out the Canaanites, and what happens? Every man does that which is right in his own eyes, right? It's chaos. And the, the book of Judges closes with the idea of there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which is right in his own eyes. There was no king in Israel. There was no king in Israel. And then the book of Ruth, and what's the book of Ruth? How does the book of Ruth end? By the way, the book of Ruth is during the time of the judges. But it ends how? Comment pointing to the David Davidic line, birth of David. Okay. So you see how it matters how you read what order you follow. So if we put Ruth after judges, it becomes the yeah, there might you might think there's not a king in Israel, but during the time of the judges, there was a king in Israel, and God is working to address the need for a king. And Ruth is the hinge between the chaos of no king and the installation of the first king of Israel in 1 Samuel. All right, so as I'm reading it, what I'm trying to do with the canonical ordering is saying, well, let's create it. I could put different books after different you know, related books and come up with different emphases, which are both true. But what, what I'm trying to do when I do the canonical approach is say, let's, as best as possible, try to figure out the order in which the Holy Spirit revealed um, the different books to his people. So what would they have known at the time of receiving that? And he's building on that. So what I'm doing is, the best way I found to do that is, I come up with some kind of chronology of the writing of the books, the order in which it was given. And I think that that matters. Um, there's no way we can come up with an inspired order where we know 100% when the books were written, because in some cases the books are anonymous. Um, there's dispute as to the dating, but as best as possible, when following this approach, I'm arguing that it's helpful to view the chronological giving of the books. That way we know what emphasis the Holy Spirit intended to give, whether if we take the book of Ruth after Judges or if it's better to place it after Proverbs 31. Um, I would say, how did the Spirit reveal it? Um, any questions on that, on the canonical ordering? I do think you can... Um, with that, you can kind of compare the book to other books. In other words, part of the canonical approach would allow for um, seeing the book of Ruth after Judges versus seeing it after Proverbs or an illustration of Proverbs without uh, saying this is the way the Holy Spirit revealed it. But here's some emphases that we can get when we compare this portion of scripture with others that are related to it. So what you would be relating in, in the Protestant approach, you would be relating the idea of, this is the time of the judges. So what's the time of the judges like? It's chaotic, but in the midst of chaos, God is still in charge. He's still in control. He's still the ultimate judge. So that's a, that's a powerful theme that can be brought up by paying attention to the canonical uh, context. And if you were to compare with the book of Proverbs, instead of focusing on the, the phrase, the time of the judges, you would focus on the, the woman of Hayil. Where have I heard that phrase before? Let me compare this concept of a virtuous woman in the rest of the canon and see if I can find a woman of Hayil, a woman of capacity. Oh, look, Ruth is called the woman of Hayil. And so you would still get to that by doing a canonical interpretation. It's just that you wouldn't get to that in, in that order necessarily. There's some uh, comments some here. And okay. I mean, this issue is actually something, I, or this question is something I'm rather interested in personally, but somebody was just coming here. I usually have a problem in the prophets. I think the minor prophets, because they're not in chronological sequence. Um, and I, that makes sense to me. I just was teaching on bibliology like last week or two weeks ago and I had a question with someone was, Someone was thinking the order we have it is like inspired authoritative order. And I said, 
yeah, there could be some, you could have some bad orders, you know, like, okay, New Testament, Old Testament clearly should be put into separate groups. Um, the Gospels belong together, the Pentateuch belongs together. You could have some bad orders, but then there's things that I wouldn't mind, like uh, people don't know that Luke Acts go together because they're separated. I get why the synoptics are together and then we have John. I mean, I get why it happened, but it's a little bit of a shame that people read the book so separately. Um, anyway, stuff like that. Any other thoughts that come to your mind about uh, the order? You know, yeah, just any thoughts that, that hit your mind? I mean, I think it's an interesting study as far as um, it reflects sometimes a theology of the person putting together the, the canon. Um, so you can't change the book itself, but uh, as if you play with the order in a sense, it kind of gives you different angles, different ways of understanding it. And so even though, I, what, what I'm saying is even though we can't know for sure what the exact order was, uh, I think we still have a really good sense for a lot of these. And where we do know for sure that a book is written in a certain place, I think it's beneficial um, to interpret it in that order. Right? Um, just what was the Holy Spirit trying to get at at that point? Ultimately, however, I don't think if we get the order wrong, if we still go and look at what has come before and what comes after, we're still going to get the, the fullness of what the Spirit was revealing about that issue. It might be a different emphasis that we get by changing the order, but I think we'll still get at the fullness of, of what was revealed with that issue. Uh, in other words, like if you, if you read the Chronicles of Narnia, if you change the order, <laughs> if you go by how the order in which they were written, it gives you one emphasis, but if you go by the way some people order them chronologically, it gives you a different sense. And, and sometimes we read through the Bible this way, right? Here's the chronological reading of the scripture, or here's the uh, some theme type of reading of the scripture. So, uh, and sometimes you read Old Testament and then you jump to the New Testament in your Bible reading just to keep both Testaments in mind at the same time. It's just a matter of different emphasis and it, it can all be helpful. What I'm trying to do in this approach is to maintain, in a sense, a chronological, canonical order and bring out that emphasis. So I have a question about that. Um, uh, are you saying go try to emphasize the, the order in which these books were written? Or, uh, or like, in other words, does that does that potentially get you into a different order than even the Old Testament Masoretic canon order? Yes, it would. Uh, as an example, we're going to talk about the book of Jonah. Um, so Jonah is saying, God is telling Jonah to go to Ninevites and preach. <laughs> and where you read that in the order of the prophets is going to make a difference. Um, is this, is Jonah the first one to mention this concept of God wanting divine revelation to go to the heathen nations? Or does this come at the end where he's been hinting at it through the other prophets? And then Jonah's the final version of that okay i've been trying to tell you guys subtly that i'm going to reach all all peoples not just jews uh and now i'm going to climax the old testament with the story of jonah and how i sent him so opens up the the uh teaching for the great commission go ye into all the world and so if where we place jonah would matter in, in the sense of is he the first one to reveal this idea or is he the last one? It's a matter of emphasis. Um, so uh, that's what we're getting at. And so, yeah, it's going to vary both from the uh, Jewish canon and the Protestant canon. 
if we're following the chronological approach. Other questions there? Uh, some of the benefits of the canonical approach. Uh, guards against neglecting certain passages. I might be tempted just by human nature. I have certain things that I really love and I'm prone to come to them again and again and again. And when I'm using all of the Bible to interpret something, uh, I'm going to pay attention as much as is appropriate to what the Holy Spirit has emphasized. So I'm not going to neglect anything because this is his story and not my, my story or my emphasis or my something I like to harp on or et cetera. Um, number two gives a fullest context. So this is just the idea of broadening the context out to the fullness of the scripture. And I would include the New Testament in this. Since this was an Old Testament uh, dissertation, I didn't really dive too much into the New Testament and how it develops the um, theology of Jonah. But we should take it to that level as well. Is balance in theology. Uh, again, this kind of relates to point one. Um, I'm going to highlight what God is highlighting. If God keeps repeating something again and again in many books, then I should emphasize that. If it's a minor issue that's mentioned once or twice, then I'm, I'm not going to say, okay, this is, this is it. This is the most important thing. Um, and it just is going to make me familiar with all the scripture, which is in, in turn going to give me a fuller picture of who God is, his character, how he works. Um, so by studying all the scripture, I'm coming to know the author better. All right. Joel, do you want to take a break here or because we're going to kind of jump into getting into the details of, of what this is like. I'm going to I hit some highlights. Of the, okay. So we can take a little break here and then we, I'll show you some highlights and cool things that I discovered as I analyze the book of Jonah. Um, all right. Any questions before the so break? I've got nine. Yeah, um, questions that are coming in here. Yeah, um, I think just kind of around some of the stuff that we've discussed before. But maybe if the guys have questions, you want to drop that in there during the break, then we can pick that up when we get back. I've got uh, 926. So we can just come back, you know, a minute or two after 930 um, and jump back in. So thanks. This is great. This is fun. All right, see you guys in a couple minutes. Get into some of the highlights of uh, my study. And this is kind of going to illustrate the whole process of interpretation, kind of step by step, with one or two examples from each category. So, first of all, let's talk about literary analysis. Um, in the last few years, the, the concept of literary analysis has really taken off, and I love it. The Bible being read as a story. Um, giving it, giving it uh, the appropriate emphasis that it should have. I, one of the biggest emphasis I have in my classes is interpreting the Bible as literature because it's literature, <laughs> a novel concept. Um, but so I'm, what I'm going to do here is just kind of show you some of the value that a literary analysis um, brings in, in the interpretive process and encourage you guys as you interpret scripture to make sure that you are spending some time seeing these elements, bringing them out, because it's really going to give fullness of understanding of, of the power of that story, of, of the beauty of the stories that God tells, and ultimately of the meaning of the story, which is what we're aiming for. It doesn't just matter what you say, it matters how you say it. And a literary analysis brings that out. I could say the exact same words that have entirely different meanings depending on how I say it. So a literary analysis focuses on how it's being said. Having said that, um, let's, we're gonna look at a couple of things. There are many things that we can jump into when studying something. 
doing a literary analysis, I'm going to focus on plot, first of all. Um, so the whole idea of plot is that when I'm telling a story, I have a beginning, a middle, and an end. I'm, I'm getting at a point. There's a punchline. And if I'm a good storyteller, I might give you some fake punchlines where you think, okay, this is the point of what he's saying, but then use that to keep building on what I'm saying. Um, so I've kind of graphed out for you the plot line of Jonah here. And so to give you a quick rundown, since we don't have the text in front of us, uh, one, one through three is the first commission. Three, one through three is the second commission. God calls Jonah, go preach to Nineveh. One, four through 14 is Jonah in, in the boat with the sailors. Three, um, three through 10, Jonah and Nineveh preaching to them. One, 15 through 17, he's thrown into the water. Uh, two, one through 10, he's in the belly of the fish. Four, one through four, he is praying uh, outside of the city of Nineveh. Four, five, and six, he's requesting to die there. Um, his interactions with God, he builds a little gourd. And then finally, four, nine through 11, the object lesson where God kills a gourd. Um, and in a sense, puts Jonah in his place. So let's follow his first model here. Um, as you begin, we have uh, chapter one, verses one through three. God says, arise, Jonah, go preach to the Ninevites. Jonah arises, he goes, and he flees. So when, when we're thinking about plot, we have this initial uh, background information that's kind of setting the the story for us, the status quo, the way things are. And there's this inciting action where something happens to get the action going. In this case, it's Jonah's disobedience. Instead of going to Nineveh, he goes in the opposite direction. Um, he, he pays his fare to a boat and is going to Tarshish. Uh, we don't know exactly where that is, but it's in the opposite direction of where Nineveh would have been. Um, and so... This begins the action when he gets into the boat, the sailors are scrambling because God sends a storm and it builds toward uh, the first climax. And that is when Jonah is saying, if you want to survive, throw me into the water. But the sailors don't want to do that because they didn't, they didn't bring this guy on their boat to kill him. So they're struggling. They're trying to go back to the land and they can't get there. And so they throw Jonah overboard reluctantly, saying, Lord, you, you're the one who's in control. We, we surrender to your sovereignty. Throw him in there. And then the water comes down. And that, that is the first climax. And Jonah goes down to the water, and God had appointed a fish to swallow him. And so the prayer in chapter 2 just is it's kind of the reset, where we're back to normal in a sense. He, he's still in a very difficult situation, but there's not a lot of action going on there. It's just him praying. It's his prayer to the Lord. It's a prayer of thanksgiving. It's not a prayer of repentance. What he's saying in chapter two is, thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. You're so good. He quotes some Psalms. Sounds quite religious there. And then the fish spits him back out on land, and it's like we've started all the way at the beginning. Um, and so chapter three, there's a second commission. And this time we're wondering how Jonah is going to respond. Like, is he going to listen? Um, has he understood what God wants of him? Um, and so this time Jonah rises, goes, and he preaches in Nineveh. The way his preaching is described is deliberately brief. Uh, yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overturned. So a very brief message. This is definitely not the kind of missionary you want to be supporting, where he's really concerned for the salvation of people. He wants their destruction, and he gives a, the way it's presented to us, it's, this is a blunt message. Jonah desires his destruction, and he makes it hard for them in a sense. He's going to obey God, but only minimally, and give a very curt, judgmental message, hoping that they 
get hardened. Instead, the opposite happens. So we're kind of left to the Ninevites receive the message and they immediately repent. I mean, shockingly, the most wicked society in ancient civilization, when they hear this message from the stranger, beginning with the king all the way down to the animals, fully repent of their evil as much as they know. And we're kind of building toward a climax. What is God going to do with the Ninevites? Is he going to destroy them like he threatened? Or will he have mercy? And so at the end of chapter 3, the Ninevites are kind of up. They leave their fate up to God. Who knows? Perhaps the Lord will repent and we won't perish. Um, and at that point, the Lord spares them. He relents from the calamity that he was going to send upon them. And they're not destroyed. But this is not the end of the story. Uh, Jonah goes outside the city and he prays again. And he's very angry, right? He says, I knew it. I knew you were a forgiving God. That's why I didn't want to go preach. Can't believe you did that. If that's the way you're going to be, kill me. Uh, it's kind of ironic. Chapter one, uh, chapter two, he's praying about salvation. Thank you, Lord, that you're a great savior. Chapter four, verses one through four, he's praying about salvation. But this time, can't believe you would save that. <laughs> it's okay when salvation applies to me, but when it applies to them, it's no good. Um, and so he's really struggling. And then um, it seems like everything is back to normal. He goes outside the city. He builds this little sh shady place for himself. And the Lord gives him this plant. In verses 7 and 8, this is what triggers the next bit of action. Jonah's kind of waiting outside the city, kind of hoping for the doom of Nineveh. Um, and the Lord sends a destructive worm to kill the gourd. And then he sends a scorching wind and the blazing heat to make Jonah feel miserable. And then it's leading up to the object lesson. All right. So the way I'm analyzing the, the plot of Jonah is, as far as the message is concerned, we are left with this climactic moment where God questions Jonah, don't I have the right to have mercy on Nineveh? It's a great city with a lot of citizens and animals, and that's never resolved. <laughs> All right, so we've been building in the story of Jonah up to the point of the object lesson at the end of the book, and we don't know the answer, so it's deliberately left open-ended. But when we analyze the plot this way, it shows us the theological value or import of each of these sections. And if we're trying to get at what was God saying in the book of Jonah, by analyzing the plot this way, uh, we need to focus on the last section because that's plot-wise that's what's really important. This is the pivotal moment. And what's kind of cool about it is the plot is left unresolved. Did Jonah repent? Did Jonah understand the message? According to the book of Jonah, what's, what's the answer? In the book of Jonah, repent. waiting for a comment. Who wants to comment? <laughs> yeah, comment here. It doesn't say someone else. It's unclear from the ending. Okay. I would say in the book, he doesn't repent. So did he repent ultimately? Well, we don't know. Um, so as a reader, what would that do for you when you, when you read the book and there's this climactic moment Jonah, don't have the right to be sovereign and have compassion on, on these people if I choose. Um, so what does that do for the reader? How do you conclude the story of Jonah when this is the climactic question of the book?
Um, I mean, I, yeah, well, here we go. I think it emphasizes that we ought to repent even if Jonah didn't. Okay. It, it forces me to answer that question, right? I am supposed to answer that question as the reader. That's why the plot is left hanging. It forces me into action to recognize, yes, God has the authority, the right, the sovereignty to forgive the most wicked of people, All right? So that's one way we can analyze the plot. Let me show you a different chart here. So that's the classic mapping out of, of the plot line. Now this is the rise and fall of Jonah's fortunes, and it gives us a different emphasis, right? In other words, when Jonah is doing well, um, it's not a good part of the story, and when he's doing poorly, that's, that's where we really learn the lessons, right? So uh, let me bring out a couple points here. <clears throat> His fort Jonah's fortunes begin to decline the moment he heads away from the Lord's commanded destination. It worsens as the storm is about to destroy the ship and drown the crew, right? So uh, up here, one, one, two, three, the commission, Jonah's doing fairly well. Yay, the Lord has called him to a ministry. This is great. Well, he disobeys. And as he goes into the ship, goes down, falls asleep, uh, they're about to die. You could say Jonah's fortunes are not good at that point, right? He gets thrown into the water. And when he goes into the water, what happens there? He gets swallowed by a great fish, right? Is that good or bad? For Jonah. I'm going to say bad. <laughs> okay, it might seem like it's bad. I would say it's good. Why is it good that Jonah got swallowed by the fish? Oh, as opposed to drowning, All right? Yeah. yeah, because he's not dead. <laughs> so we sometimes we look at the fish and think, oh, this is God's judgment, but it's actually God's salvation. The fish is a good thing. So as a matter of fact, in his language, he talks about going down, down, down. And then he says, but you brought me up. Well, he brought him up by using that fish. So his fortunes start to improve when he gets swallowed. Um, as I mentioned in the previous plot line, Jonah didn't really repent at all in the book, but, but it mentions explicitly anyway. Um, and so his fortunes kind of continue to improve. He gets spit out onto the dry land. So that's better than being in the belly of the fish. He gets another commission. And so it's looking good for Jonah. Uh, he obeys. So you would think, okay, this is a good thing. But when he sees what happens with Nineveh, what, what does he desire in, in chapter four at the end of his prayer? Have you ever prayed the Lord to do this for you? Dear Lord, Please kill me. Have you ever been that desperate in life where you're asking for divinely assisted suicide? <laughs> um, yeah, I would say Jonah's in a worse situation in chapter four that he's really struggling emotionally, spiritually, psychologically, in every way. Um, God, God answers, in a sense, he, he provides some relief. Uh, Jonah's, Jonah's behaving, his behavior is not uh, maybe unprecedented. There, there have been, remember the behavior of Elijah after the victory at Mount Carmel? I'm the only believer left. It's better for me to die at this point. So... We sometimes have events in life that really cause us to despair and, and lose the big picture of who God is and his plan for us. And so what does God do for Jonah to help him out? This is Jonah at his happiest in the book of Jonah. Why is Jonah so happy in the book? What's going on in verses five and six, chapter four? He 
He's waiting for destruction. Okay. But if you have a text, look at uh, Jonah 4, 5, and 6. Why is Jonah so happy? He's got his little plan. <laughs> the the Hebrew is uses the diminutive form. This is a form that's not very common, but it it highlights the smallness of the plant. In other words, we could translate that an itty bitty plant. And what's Jonah's emotional state in verse six? How did Jonah feel about the plant? Commented on here, relieved, glad. Okay, the Hebrew is more explicit. It says, he rejoiced with great joy. He was super duper happy about this itty bitty plant, right? So it's kind of ironic that uh, the thing that Jonah gets most excited about and is most pleased with is so small. But I think that that communicates the, the message of Jonah pretty clearly, that Jonah's priorities are, are messed up. He finds the small things important and the big things not as important. And that's where God is going to take him now. Um, he's, this is the only place in the book where he's happy. And what does God do to his little bitty plant? Verses 7 and 8, the Lord had appointed a worm that came and chewed up the plant. <laughs> so God takes away his source of joy. And once again, Jonah's despairing at the end of verse 8. It would be better for me to die than to live. And a lot of times in the Hebrew, he's actually requesting his soul to die. Soul, die. Um, but God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plan? And he said, yes, I have a right to be this angry. Please kill me. Um, and so at the end of the book, Jonah's left pouting, right? So if we follow the fortunes of Jonah, it's going to highlight different aspects of, of the message of the book. And, and I would say once again, it's, going to lead us to chapter 4, verses 9 through 11. It's a key part to unlock what the book of Jonah is all about. Because as Jonah's sulking there, uh, we're waiting on his answer. Is, is this stubborn, um, vengeful prophet going to get what the Lord is trying to do here through him for these people? Okay, the final way we can analyze the plot is illustrated for you in this chart. Um, so what I'm doing here is I'm following Dorsey. Um, Dorsey has these different ways that he uh, understands the structures of the Old Testament. He has a linear um, arrangement, a parallel arrangement, or a symmetric arrangement. And what we do here is we just kind of Look at the text and allow the text itself through repetition or keywords to arrange itself. And so sometimes a setting helps, sometimes keywords help. I think most people would at least divide the book of Jonah into two parts as far as the story. The first commission and the second commission. Those commissions are nearly verbatim. So that those make the two major divisions of the book. Uh, what's interesting here is that after the first commission, we have Jonah and the pagan sailors. After the second commission, we have Jonah and the Ninevites, these pagans. Um, after the experience with the pagans, Jonah prays in both contexts. His first prayer is long and lofty. His second prayer is short and uh, he is... He's an angry guy. 
right? And I think when we compare the two prayers, it shows that Jonah was being hypocritical in the first prayer. The first prayer is about God's salvation, but the object of salvation is Jonah. So he's going to go on and on and on and on about how good God is to say, salvation belongs to the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. And in chapter four, he's like, I can't believe salvation belongs to you. Why? How dare you save them? So when you analyze the plot this way, it shows that as you read the prayer in chapter two, you read in light of the prayer in chapter four, Jonah's being a hypocrite. He's not really repenting at all when he's praying. He's just grateful that he got saved. And okay, so what do you notice about the last section there? Yahweh's mercy lesson. How does that differ from the other parts of this arrangement? comment uh it's god who mainly talks okay so up to this point i mean god has spoken before right he, he gave the commissions uh but then he really talks here what else just just look at the the whole chart and see if you can bring out what's weird about this last section Uh, comment was here. Compassion is on both Jonah and Nineveh. All right. Yes. Um, just kind of on a more literary structure level, we have Jonah's first commission, Jonah's second commission. Jonah and the sailors, Jonah and the Ninevites. Jonah's first prayer, Jonah's second prayer. The hour's mercy lesson. So what's different about that? So it's, 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 it's not matched. I mean, it stands by itself. Right. So it doesn't have a, a match. It doesn't have a parallel. And this is one of the ways that an author can highlight the importance of something by making it stick out on purpose. And so when we look at the plot this way, once again, we see that the important lesson for us from a plot perspective is going to be found in that last section. Okay, um, any questions there as far as what I'm doing with the plots? What I'm doing with the plot to discover is where is the message of Jonah? Like what's, what, what is the book getting at? And I've used three different plot approaches and, and each of those, and actually I use a fourth uh, in, in my own study, but each of those is gonna highlight that the message of the book is found in chapter four, verses five through 11, that last section is gonna tell us what the book is all about, okay? It's your, your analysis helped. Um, for a long time, I struggled with chapter two. What was going on here? How did it fit into the whole? It fit in with everything else. And I, I eventually came to the conclusion that it was a hypocritical prayer. Um, anyway, at stuff like verse eight, those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love seems to have resonances back to chapter one where the sailors repent and they make vows to Yahweh and the whole flip of chapter one where it's like who is actually the Yahweh worshiper we can't figure out who's the who's the pagan and who's the Yahweh worshiper um right. chapter two verse eight feels stuffy like those bad foolish idolaters and um mm -hmm. it's like world upside down still but anyway I, <laughs> I wasn't, I wasn't feeling secure enough in that conclusion, <laughs> but some of the points that you're making are, are really helpful. <laughs> it's good. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I, it really, the, the main traditional way of approaching chapter two is God commands Jonah to go preach. 
he puts him in the in the belly of the fish to uh, punish him, and he repents. And so since he repents in chapter two, God says, okay, I'm going to let you get out of the fish and continue with your ministry. But he never repents in chapter two. He's just thanking God that he saved him. <laughs> so it really does turn the, the uh, prayer on its head that this, you shouldn't be reading this in the sense of this is a model prayer that I, I should imitate, but what a hypocrite. What a, I mean, he's just going on and on, quoting scripture, making himself look good, but he doesn't really uh, accept what God is trying to do in salvation. So while mouthing the word salvation belongs to the Lord, he really believes that it belongs to him and it's up to him to decide who gets saved and who doesn't. Okay, any other questions or comments there? Um, I forget, is Jonah 2 quoted elsewhere in the Psalms? And if so, what do we do with that? Yeah, so Jonah is actually quoting some Psalms. He would have been meditating uh, or citing some of the Psalms. Um, it shows us that he was at least a professing believer. He's a prophet. I, I do think Jonah's a believer, but um, he had fallen to this conception of God has to fit my mold, uh, my theology, and how dare God go outside of what I think is acceptable for God to do. So um, it's just showing a little bit of Jonah's thinking, his his theology, his Bible reading, Bible knowledge more than anything, probably. Um, so, I, I mean, I think we're like Jonah a lot, that if you, if you ask us about anything, we could go scripture left and right. But it's not so a matter of what, what you have in your brain, but are you submitting to the message in your life? So he says in chapter one, I fear Yahweh, the creator. In the meantime, he's running away from God. Like, how can you really fear Yahweh if you're blatantly disobeying him? Um, so I think chapter two is more of the same, just quoting scripture, showing he should have known better. He has the right creed. He has the right verses. Uh, the Pharisees follow the tradition of Jonah. They know scripture. Um, they quote scripture all the time, but they're not submissive to its message. Even like the chapter four, um, I knew to your gracious God, merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, for relenting from disaster. A disaster seems like it has echoes back to the way God revealed Himself to Moses uh, when He hid Him away in the rock. I mean, even that kind of has this intertextuality thing. It's like there's the knowledge, right, right. and yet Jonah's flipping yeah. it on its head. He hates that this is true. Right, and that's one of the things that, as you do the canonical approach, you would. Uh, recall where was this verse given um, and put it in its proper context. So Jonah should have known God's nature and accepted it. <laughs> uh, he should have delighted in, in the mercy that God displayed. But I think even people like Joshua, right? We have a tendency to say, us only, we are God's people. And Moses stopped them how, you know, they're not allowed to, to do this. And the disciples have the same mindset. Like we kind of, when God saves us, there might be a temptation to think we're better. Uh, but Jonah's kind of highlighting, no, salvation. God's limited to a, an ethnic group or, or something that's bound historically to a certain people. But it, Salvation can go to anyone, and we're all sinners. And that's one of the highlights of Jonah as well, that as far as characterization is concerned, he's the worst character in the book. The man of God is the worst character in the book. The sailors are better, the Ninevites are better, and even the animals, in a sense, are better um, than Jonah. Right? So it's by comparing uh, that to Deuteronomy and what God revealed to Moses about his mercy, 
I think it's deliberately highlighting Jonah should have known um, about God's mercy and accepted it. Okay, let's get into repetition. So we've looked at plot. We can look at characterization. That's a very helpful thing to do. I'm not going to do it today. Um, so Alter in his uh, work on literary analysis lists five uses of repetition within biblical narratives that we should be paying attention to. Those five are the lead word, the lead word idea, the light vert, uh, number two, motif, three, theme, four, sequence of action, and five, type scenes. So I've taken three of the five that he gives because they're most helpful for the book of Jonah. And what I'm gonna do is kind of illustrate with some of these words how when we pay attention to uh, key repeated words, it brings out different emphases in the story, and it's, it's really helpful. All right, so first of all, let's go with dabar and its related term, uh, kara. So I'm going to switch over here to Bible Works, and we'll start with 1-1. One, one. So here's our word, dabar. Do a search. I'm going to keep in Jonah. All right, so here we go. Um, so Yahweh's Dabar comes to Jonah as a commission. Due to Jonah's disobedience, Yahweh's Dabar comes to him again in 3.1. Uh, he reluctantly submits his time. When Yahweh's Dabar reaches the king of Nineveh, he, re he responds immediately. Right, so the word came unto the king of Nineveh. This is the Dabar. Uh, I think it's interesting that the king is highlighted as being the first to respond. As normally when we, when we have a repentance of a people, it's a grassroots movement. And they petition the leadership to respond. But in this case, it starts with the king and then it goes down from him. And I think there's something going on there with the, the historicity. Um, when, when bad things happen like famines and earthquakes and eclipses, they beat them as bad omens. And historically that had happened in Nineveh. Um, and the threats are directly against the king. So I think that's why in this context, the king repents. On seeing the repentance of the Ninevites, Yahweh relents of his initial davar in 310. Okay, so we have here, uh, God relented concerning the judgment that he had threatened them with and did not destroy them. All right, so uh, the evil which he spoke. This sends Jonah into rage as he reveals that his devar about Yahweh's mercy motivated him to flee. So we see devar here. Was this not my word when I said yada yada? So that's why I rebelled. Um, a related term to Devar is kara, to proclaim. And so here we start in chapter 1, verse 2. Uh, kara. Yahweh commands Jonah to proclaim a message for him. In 1 2, instead of speaking on behalf of Yahweh to the pagans, Jonah is called upon to proclaim to God in behalf of the pagans. So instead of proclaiming to the Ninevites, the pagans are telling Jonah to proclaim to God, call out to your God, maybe he will have mercy on us. Um, 1 14, the sailors proclaim to Yahweh, don't hold innocent blood against us. 
Uh, it's only when he's about to drown that Jonah's forced to proclaim to Yahweh help. So I called out to the Lord for my distress. So in a sense, Jonah finally starts proclaiming here, but he's forced to do so. This is still not a message spoken for Yahweh, but merely a prayer addressed to him. Upon receiving the second command to proclaim for Yahweh in 3.2, uh, he proclaims a five-word message um, in 3.4. So we look at the Hebrew and he said, yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overturned. Right? And this causes the Ninevites to proclaim a fast in the next verse. So they proclaim the fast and then they proclaim to God. Um, everybody call out to God. So again, you're seeing how these repeated words are highlighting this whole concept of the word of God and our obligation to respond to it in certain ways. Another repeated term that I give you there is Yara. So on the handouts, we have Davar Kara, Yara to fear. And we see this at the beginning here in chapter one, verse four. Um, that's not verse four, it's, it's, there it is, verse five. Let's do a quick search on that, Lima. So the sailors have this Yara. And when you look at the sailors Yara, it's they're just scared to die. The storm came. They're superstitious. I think a lot of times these ancient peoples, when these kinds of calamities came upon them, they are very superstitious. Let's pray to the God of the sea. Somebody got him angry or something. Uh, in one nine. Jonah is pro professing to fear Yahweh. So this gives a different idea to the concept of fear. It's not primarily an emotion or a superstitious reaction, but information. Jonah has the right theology, so it brings out a different element of what fear is. Uh, chapter 1, verse 10, then the men became extremely afraid. So now they're responding to the revelation that he's given them, and they have a more informed fear. It's they still don't know Yahweh, but um, they're scared of what he could do to them because they have a stowaway. And then I think there's a fuller, appropriate fear that they come to after they throw Jonah into the water and the water calms down. I would say this is a good type of fear. Then they feared with a great fear and worshiped. So a true fear of Yahweh leads to worship. So it's just kind of interesting how different aspects of fear are brought out as you trace that word. Um, and it shows the, the condition in which different people find themselves. Uh, people who don't know God, who don't know Jesus, might be superstitious and have certain fears about things. Um, People who've grown up in Christianity, unfortunately, oftentimes just have a mental fear. They have the right information about who God is, but they don't actually have a relationship with him. And that's Jonah. He just has this hypocritical type of fear. Um, and what we're striving for, in a sense, is to have every part of this kind of fear is appropriate in our relationship with God, that if we are living in rebellion, then we should fear consequences for our disobedience. Um, but ultimately, a mature type of fear is worshiping the Lord, which is what the sailors got to. Um, another word here is yadeng, to know in 1.7. Hold on. 
Okay, here we go. Okay, so here we go. Come and discuss a lot so that we may learn on whose account this calamity has struck us. So the first yadang begins with the investigation. The sailors are ignorant but desire to learn. They finally learn the truth about Jonah in 110. Um, over 120,000 Ninevites are characterized by Yahweh as not knowing uh, the difference between their right and their left. They confess both their ignorance and faith. When they stayed in 3.9, who knows, God may turn and relent. In contrast to the pagans, Jonah reveals that he knew it was his fault that the storm was upon the sailors in chapter 1, verse 12. Um, he also knew God's gracious nature and thus had refused to warn the Ninevites, chapter 4, verse 2. So we can use our knowledge of Yahweh wrongly. In spite of his abundance of knowledge, Jonah does not act faithfully. In spite of the pagans' lack of knowledge, they display much faith. So it's kind of the paradox that Jesus sees in his day that Jews who know so much exercise so little faith, and Gentiles who don't really know much exercise great faith. Um, okay, let's go back to the handout here. Some leading motifs, and we're... I'm not going to trace all of these out. I'll just kind of uh, mention some things. So it's interesting as you read the story of Jonah that it begins with the idea of Yarad to go down. He goes down to Joppa. He goes down into the boat. He goes down into the water. He's about to drown. There's this idea of Jonah's going down. Um, and that's a bad thing. <laughs> it's, it's showing Jonah's rebellion in a sense. And there's a pivotal transition in chapter 2 where as he's going down, the Lord brings him up. And so there's this arising theme. God wants, in a sense, people to arise. Uh, so that's an interesting motif that uh, kind of brings out the color of the story, the, the contrast between going down, which is our nature, and rising up, which is what God does for us. Uh, another interesting motif that comes out is the, the concept of gadol, which is great. There are a lot of things in the book that are described as great. Uh, so the Nineveh is called great. The city of Nineveh is called great three times. God sends a great wind. There's a great storm on the sea. The sailors respond with great fear. God appoints a great fish. Um, the miraculous repentance of Nineveh is from the greatest of its citizens to the least. Uh, Jonah's emotions fluctuate from a great evil to a great rejoicing. Uh, and it's also used of the overnight growing of the plant. It grew greatly. So it creates an atmosphere that is great in the book of Jonah. And the larger than life atmosphere would highlight the importance of the message of the book. I think another thing that it would do is when you're reading this about greatness and you get to the end of the story and, and Jonah's highlighting something so small. Right? God is talking about these great things and Jonah's focused on an, a little itty bitty plant showing how off Jonah's thinking and theology is. And some themes that come out by observing repetition. Uh, the word hurl and a point are repeated. So a little bit on hurl. The Lord hurls a great wind upon the sea. So Jonah runs away from God, but God is saying, I don't think so. He hurls a storm to stop him. Uh, this causes a, a chain reaction of hurling. <laughs> The sailors are first are forced to hurl their cargo, chapter 1, verse 5. Jonah requests to be hurled into the sea, chapter 1, verse 12. After resisting Jonah's suggestion, the sailors have no choice but to hurl him into the sea, 115. 
Um, so Yahweh's act of hurling, in a sense, causes everybody else to hurl. <laughs> um, the word verb mana is used four times. It's the idea of appointing, highlighting Yahweh's sovereignty once again. So Yahweh appoints a great fish to deliver Jonah from death. He appoints a plant to deliver Jonah from discomforts. He um, appoints a worm to smite the plant, and he appoints a scorching wind that smites Jonah. So this, this concept of appointing and hurling, they're both highlighting that God is in control in spite of what man may try to do. Uh, let's see here. Uh, man's repentance is another theme that's highlighted by a couple of words, shuv, to turn from, and ranya, evil. Uh, so God has this evil that he's threatening to send upon the city of Nineveh because of its evil. But since they turn from their evil, they turn from their sin, God turns from his evil, from his threatened calamity. This whole concept of evil and turning is highlighting man's repentance. Um, also, God's compassion is brought out through repetition of a few words, Naham, Hanun, uh, Eric, Afin, literally long of nostrils. The Hebrew idiom for getting angry is that the nostrils burn. So when God is described as having long nostrils, it's that it takes him a long time for his anger to burn, for him to get angry. Um, abounding in loyal love, much of hesed, and full of pity or uh, hus. So these synonyms for compassion highlight um, that God is a compassionate God. Okay, any questions on the whole repetition section? Uh, let's see. Let's hit the theological highlights real quick. Um, so theologically, once we've gone through the process of analyzing the book from a literary perspective and kind of coming out with the main themes, the main plots, repeated ideas, mo motifs, uh, this allows us to uh, speak of the theological emphasis of the book of Jonah. And there are several different emphases in the book. I highlight five or six of them. Uh, I'm just going to highlight two in this discussion. Uh, first of all, the sovereignty of Yahweh. When you study the book, not only through the repeated phrases and, and actions of God, he is shown as the sovereign one. He's called, in a sense, sovereign. He's the creator of the heavens and the earth. He speaks as one who is sovereign. He commands. He instructs, he rebukes, so all of those different types of speech from God highlight his sovereignty. His actions highlight his sovereignty. He's the, even though man does things, so in a, we could study the book of Jonah from a character perspective. It's Jonah versus Yahweh. Who's going to win? Well, when you read the story, God always wins. So the contrasting would highlight uh, God's sovereignty in Jonah. We talk about man's free will. Does man have a free will? Uh, he does, but it's not an absolute free will. Only one being can have an absolute free will, and that would be God. He has his way in the armies of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. So ultimately, there can be only one who is in complete control. Another theme that's highlighted is God's compassion. Uh, so we can trace this out uh, following um, the different objects of compassion. So the most obvious recipient of God's compassion is Nineveh. What's interesting about the uh, Ninevites is that they are the least likely recipients from a um, who deserves to be forgiven perspective. Uh, the Ninevites are the most brutal, violent uh, people in their day. And so to try to get a, an understanding of what God is asking Jonah to do, imagine a Holocaust survivor 
reaching out to a Jewish Holocaust survivor, reaching out to a Nazi, a German Nazi. How easy would it be for someone like that to reach out to someone like uh, a Nazi or um, uh, an African American who survived a lynching reaching out to the KKK? This is the kind of thing that God is asking Jonah to do, to go to the Ninevites. And so when you think of the Ninevites, they don't deserve mercy. They're described in... So doing a canonical comparison, they're described in the same way, in a sense, as Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma and Zeboim, and what happened to them? Well, they were destroyed. They were burnt to the ground. And that's what should have happened to Nineveh, but uh, we're surprised here at God's compassion toward them. Jonah is also a recipient of compassion. Um, when he runs away, God sends a storm to prevent him from fearing. Instead of killing him, he's trying to get him back. Uh, he keeps a fish. He sends a fish to keep Jonah from drowning. Um, and at the end of the story, he's still trying to instruct, patiently instruct Jonah. The sailors also receive compassion when you say, well, I mean, that's a bummer for the sailors. They lost all the cargo and their ship got damaged. But if you think about it from another perspective, they came to meet and see Yahweh in action. Um, so of all the characters in the book of Jonah, it seems like they would come the closest to having a true knowledge of who Yahweh really was. Um, lastly here, the, the overall message of the book of Jonah, I would say, is Yahweh's sovereign compassion. And I, to get there, I, I went through a lot of steps. And there are several suggestions as to what we should be doing with the book of Jonah, what the main message of the book is. Uh, I'm using the text to lead me to the emphasis that Jonah is highlighting God as the sovereign, compassionate one. Um, and he's, he contributes this idea to the stories that have come before. Uh, what's If we place Jonah within the uh, chronological arrangement of the prophets. Then after Jonah, so I, I date Jonah 760 BC. After Jonah, we get these prophets that are emphasizing the nations of Assyria and Babylon joining with Israel in the true worship of Yahweh at some point in the future. So in other words, it's, it's Jonah who opens up this concept of God reaching out to the nations and the rest of the prophets kind of pick up on that and develop it further. And then when we get to the New Testament, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so what I would say is that, in a sense, Jonah got that light to the Gentiles idea uh, started. Okay, are there any questions? Looks like we're out of time here. Any final questions, comments? So, one discussion that happened in the chat, um, something was linking this in with Jesus' use of this, the uh, the sign of the prophet Jonah. Is this yep. supposed to? Is Jesus' choice of this literary illusion kind of sticking it to the Jews in a way that you know, saying, okay, your attitudes are mirroring Jonah's in some way, um, and then this becoming the sign of him specifically as you know, he's the Messiah. So. What do you think? I think it heightens their, their guilt when you read it. In other words, going back to the story of Nineveh, Jonah, the hateful prophet, preached a brief message, and the wicked Ninevites, completely ignorant of what God wanted specifically, received it immediately. All right, so... It's just this, in a sense, impossible. This rogue prophet preaches a message and these ignorant pagans receive it readily. Here I am, the word of God, addressing the people of God, and you harden your, your hearts. So when we read it in light of the, the story of Jonah, it would heighten 
the guilt of the Jews that they should have known better, um, but they don't. And yeah, in a sense, it is it is comparing them to Jonah, the character, in their stubbornness, because it's not as if they don't have the information. They're just unwilling to receive the implication of the message. They, they don't, they still have the same mindset, like we are righteous and everybody else is wicked. We deserve salvation and nobody else does. So I would say, yes, it definitely highlights their guilt and their, their hardness more than anything, their hypocrisy. That's really helpful. That's great. Uh, and that ties into what we've focused in here on intertextuality. So. That's great. Um, there's a, one more comment here. Yeah, uh, the same picture showing up in the New Testament. It's the Gentiles that recognize the Messiah immediately. The woman by the well, the Syrophoenician woman. Some of this contrast that pops out strongly, like in Matthew, um, the people that you expected to accept are rejecting the people that were the last you would expect are the ones that are coming. That's neat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, God guys, anything else we want to toss in here? I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just saying, God saves the least likely, and that highlights his grace. Um, it's not something that we're born into. It's not something that we deserve. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And even though Jonah, when he says that in the context, he doesn't mean what he's saying. <laughs> Ultimately, salvation does belong to the Lord. I've taken that that two ten um, salvation belongs to the Lord is a like a really programmatic or anyway just a um, a really succinct statement of a core idea for the book because then mm -hmm. Yahweh what your idea sovereign compassion I mean Yahweh ends up saving some unexpected people and the sailors beginning you have salvation you have the Ninevites unexpected salvation. Uh, and then Yahweh shows his compassion. Jonah hates the compassion of Yahweh, and yet it's the only thing that's keeping him alive. Um, right. So, yeah, it's like salvation is of the Lord, not you. Do you would you view it that as, as a significant, like, kind of programmatic summary statement or something? Or I think it's a helpful summary statement. I think it's somewhat ironic that Jonah is the one who says that. So <laughs> part of the the paradox and the uh, irony of the book is that God takes words that weren't necessarily meant by the speaker. Um, like Jonah is not talking about Yahweh's salvation along the lines of the Lord can save whomever he chooses. <laughs> uh, but God is going to take his own words and in a sense use them as a theme of the book. So I, I think it's appropriate to take that phrase within the whole message of the book as a good summary, even though within the immediate context, Jonah doesn't know what he's saying. <laughs> That's helpful. That's great. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time. Yeah, no problem. Um, you guys have any questions? Here, thank you. Email? I'm sorry, what's up? I'm saying if you guys have any questions, uh, I'd be glad to correspond by email or whatever. It's fine. Thank you. A uh, guy commented here, thank you, Dr. Saldivar. You made me want to relook at Jonah. <laughs> so it's great. <laughs> um, another guy just asked if uh, he could get the outline that you used here. And maybe the easiest thing, if you just email it to me, I can make it available to everybody like that. Sure. If, if, if you're willing to do that. But. Yeah. Um, all right. Thank you again for your time. Very appreciative. This was helpful. No problem. All right. The Lord bless you guys. Uh, thank you. To all of us, we'll see you guys back on uh, Monday night. Well, Monday night, our time in Southeast Asia, 8 p.m. or 8 a.m. Uh, U.S. Eastern Standard Time. So, okay. Thank you. Have a good night.